It's a great pleasure to introduce Mihai because of his science, which is absolutely groundbreaking and stunning, uh, showing that the innate immune system that we all thought was kind of a stupid first line of defense in the immune system that we didn't really need uh, very much because we had an adaptive immune system which had a memory and could deal with all the memory issues for us, that this innate immune system in fact has a memory and can be trained. So this is absolutely new knowledge which is reforming uh, the immunological field, it's reforming vaccinology, but also having spillover effects into cancer, uh, to literally every field within medicine that is now affected by this research, by this new knowledge about the innate immune system. So, so it's uh, super exciting research, but I also just want to mention that I'm really glad to have the pleasure of also introducing Diaz to Mihai because I think Diaz is a, a wonderful breeding place for a lot of scientists from different fields and Mihai just got the very brief impression of that by having lunch in the lunchroom and seeing that around the table were all five faculties with young assistant professors and, and uh, all working in their each, each their interesting field and, and I think that's uh, really the strength and the fun part of Diaz. It makes me proud to present Diaz to, to somebody like Mihai. But I also think it's an opportunity to tell the young assistant professors at Diaz um, something important, uh, and that is that Mihai is not only a very uh, special uh, and gifted scientist, but he is also somebody I'm really glad to introduce because he is a very special person. And you are also a very humble person, Mihai, so I know you wouldn't appreciate me for for saying such nice things about you, but I really just want to say that you're not only a great scientist, but you're also a really nice person. And I think it's important for also for all you aspiring stars in Diaz, all the young assistant professors, uh, that for me, it doesn't just take somebody very brilliant to become a good researcher. It's also important with the personal skills. And I just have to say that at the same time as you're a brilliant researcher, Mihai, you are also an extremely generous person with your ideas. I know nobody else who shares so willingly and freely all the best ideas, all the newest uh, data, and, and with that, uh, at the same time, the same degree or the big degree of humbleness. I think that makes you a very special and a very whole researcher, and uh, I think that's an example. I'm, I'm so happy to present here also for the young assistant professors. So, this is my warmest recommendation of this uh, talk and my warmest welcome to you, Mihai, and uh, I'll give you the floor from here. And you have to unmute now. I'll mute myself. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your very kind words. And for me, it's an honor to be together with you today and uh, to share with you some of our work that we have done in the last uh, 10 years or so. And I will try to make a, a, a short summary of, of how we started to, uh, to understand some new properties that, uh, that immune cells have. And they are very useful, we believe, in the way that we defend ourselves against infections, but also in trying to understand how vaccine works. And uh, some of my interest, I mean, I'm, I'm working in immunology, but traditionally in, in uh, trying to understand immune immune regulation during severe infections, such as sepsis or severe fungal infections. But we started to be um, interested more and more about uh, how uh, Basil Calmet geran BCG vaccine, is working. Because some 12, 13 years ago, we have read some old literature, and this is a slide actually which is uh, borrowed from, uh, from Peter and Christina, um, in which people have described, and this is, uh, this is a study that has been done in uh, Sweden almost 100 years ago, People describe that BCG vaccine can protect against other types of infections and decrease mortality beyond the protection against tuberculosis. So this is a study in which you can see that the, uh, that the mortality in the children vaccinated with BCG in Sweden decreased by a little bit more than 50%. And the mortality was quite high because this is before the time of antibiotics and so on. But this, could not, this very deep, steep decrease cannot be explained by the TB deaths because the TB deaths were very, uh, very limited or very limited, at least uh, uh, below 1%. And this type of epidemiological observation has been made many times um, uh, during, uh, during uh, the introduction of BCG in the beginning. Uh, uh, epidemiologically, thereafter, there were very important clinical trials done, many of them done by Peter and Christina in, in Africa. And 
this is this is a systematic review written by uh, by um, a WHO Sage uh, group, and everything that is on the left side, let's say, of the line, is a lower relative risk uh, for mortality if the children were vaccinated with BCG. So, in the end, the conclusion was that indeed, most likely, BCG can protect against uh, against uh, 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 mortality. But that was not uh, uh, a specific uh, um, a specific um, uh, reason why uh, or a specific um, effect. It was a broad protection against neonatal sepsis, against respiratory tract infections, and that contributed to the, this decrease of mortality. In parallel, there were a couple of studies also that have shown the same thing happening in the adults or the elderly, with uh, here a couple of, uh, 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 of reports uh, showing a strong reduction of respiratory tract infections, for example, in BCG revaccinated individuals in various parts of the world. So we were interested to understand what is happening here, because this is a little bit strange from an immunological point of view. We all know in all immunological books is written that, well, BCG protected, uh, protects against a specific uh, disease, and that specificity is given by antigens, by small components from, uh, from the target pathogen, which are added into a vaccines, and we build immunological memory which is specific, built through TMB cells. But this could, not, uh, this could not actually explain this broad protection and this general decrease in mortality in the BCG-vaccinated children. So first of all, we wanted to be sure that, uh, that this, is, um, this is actually happening. And we asked ourselves, can we observe the same process of protection by BCG in a control model of infection in humans? And of course, it is tough now to start to infect humans. Unless we do it uh, in a different way, we can, for example, use another live attenuated vaccine, which is inducing a very mild infection, which is generally protective, um, uh, as a model of infection in humans. And for that, we have used yellow fever vaccination. Yellow fever vaccine is an attenuated virus, and it gives a viremia in the people, and we can measure the viremia in the blood by doing a PCR. So basically, when we get a yellow fever vaccine, we get a very mild infection with this attenuated virus. So what we did, we did a proof of principle uh, uh, trial in which uh, a number of people got a placebo, another group of people uh, got BCG vaccination, and one month later, everybody got yellow fever vaccine. And we thereafter took blood at several time points after the yellow fever vaccination, and we measure the viremia, the number of virus particles in the blood of these individuals, just to see what is happening. And you can see it here in the beginning. This is a logarithmic scale. And in the beginning, few people had yet the virus because it still has to grow and so on, so we can detect it in a small number of individuals. At the end, on day seven, the virus is eliminated also because that's what it should happen. But in the middle of this, uh, of this week, most of the people had virus in their blood. And what we have observed is that BCG vaccinated uh, individuals had very significantly less viral particles in the blood. So basically, BCG was able to protect against this very mild infection uh, with, uh, with the yellow fever vaccine virus, decreasing the viremia in the circulation. Despite the decrease in the viremia in the viral particles, the process of building a protective effect of it against yellow fever was perfectly fine. This is, uh, this is the titer of the antibodies three months later, which was perfectly fine despite the fact that the virus numbers were smaller. So this was very important. And then we thought, okay, so now we can see in a controlled manner that BCG can do this. And actually, we did another study that I, due to time, and it's also published, uh, we showed the same thing with the parasitemia after an experimental human model of malaria. So we can observe the same thing with a parasite. So how is this working? Once again, this, this cannot work most likely through, uh, uh, through adaptive immune memory, because there we build memory T and B cells that remember a certain pathogen, but in an antigen-specific manner. So those memory T and B cells recognize very specifically one pathogen. So if we get whatever, a measles uh, uh, vaccines or, or a pneumococcus vaccines, let's say, we give a pneumococcus vaccine, 
And then it protects against pneumococcus. You build memory B cells, plasma cells, and so on. You make very specific antibodies against pneumococcus, but that is antigen specific. It will not protect us against uh, Escherichia coli or whatever. So we could not explain this effect through adaptive immune cells. On the other hand, we have innate immune cells, such as myeloid cells, which is the majority in our circulation. Seven, 60 to 70 percent of our cells in the circulations are, uh, are, um, uh, are neutrophils, and approximately 5 percent, again, are monocytes. So the myeloid cells are three quarters of our cells in the blood. The other 25 percent is, is lymphoid cells. But we thought, well, they are non-discriminate. They are uh, they are non-specific in the way that they fight different types of infections, but according to the immunology books, they were not supposed to have an immunological memory. They would not supposed to remember. So we thought, would it be possible that there is adaptation also in this type of cells? And for this hypothesis, we were supported actually from, by evolutionary arguments, because if we look at all the species on Earth, it is only the vertebrates, which is maybe at most 5% of the species on Earth, who have an adaptive immune system. Lymphocytes, they exist only in vertebrates. Insects or plants or cephalopods, very complex animals, for example, an octopus does not have uh, adaptive immune responses. It only has innate immune response. Does it mean also, then, that they don't have immunological memory? Well, this could happen in principle, but that would be very strange because, evolutionarily speaking, building immunological memory, adapting to a previous infection, would be very advantage advantageous. And we had literally hundreds of millions of years to, to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to evolve that. And for example, the eye has evolved more than 20 times during the evolution, so why would immunological memory not evolve outside the vertebrates? But if you look at, at, at the literature, you will always also see that actually a plant, if it, uh, uh, for example, if it survives an infection and does not die, it becomes more resistant to that infection. And this is a process which is just called, with other terms, it is called systemic acquired resistance. But in fact, it's just immunological memory. It's precisely the same, it's just the name which is different. And in insects, the same process is called immune priming. So it is just that different fields of investigations have, gi have given different names, but to the same process of building immunological memory in the innate immune responses. So we asked ourselves at that point, is it possible then that our innate immune cells also build such adaptation to a previous infection? Do they have also a kind of memory? Which, by the way, might be antigen independent, that means that you improve the response, but not specifically only against one type of microorganism. So we, we asked ourselves, and we went back to the, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the clinical trials, and we asked the people who, uh, uh, who uh, got BCG very kindly to give us some blood before and after BCG, and this is two weeks after and three months later. And we took the cells, we purified them, and then we started to, in, uh, to stimulate them, not only with mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the target disease, but also with other types of pathogens, other bacteria such as Staphylococcus aureus, fungi such as Candida albicans. And here you can observe the production of interferon gamma, which is a production of natural killer cells and T cells, but which is increased not only to MTB, but also to Staph aureus and Candida albicans, but we also did that by purifying myeloid cells and looking at the production of cytokines such as TNF, interleukin-1-beta, by myeloid cells that were not supposed to have any type of immunological memory. But we see that they actually respond better after the BCG vaccination. Interestingly and importantly, they respond better no matter what type of stimulus we use. No matter whether we use MTB or Staph aureus or Candida, they just do better. So basically, they increase their, uh, their type of response. Is this important for what we have observed in terms of, of reducing the viremia? And here, we went back to the study, we, we go back to the study in which we did, we did the yellow fever vaccination, and we assessed which immunological factors are correlated with inhibition of viral replication. So 
what kind of immunological factor, for example, is associated with a decrease in the number of viruses. And my, our hypothesis first was that most probably because this is a virus, there will be the interferon responses, which would be associated with the decrease in viremia. But to our big surprise, we could not observe any correlation between the capacity of the cells to produce either type 1 or type 2 interference, so interferon alpha, beta, or gamma, and the virus, uh, the virus uh, replication in the blood, the number of viruses. However, when we assess the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as interleukin-1 or interleukin-6, by the monocytes, they were strongly correlated, as you can see here, the capacity of the cell to produce R1 beta, upon stimulation with a fungus, for example, very, very non-specific, was correlated with the CT value in the yellow fever PCR. The CT value, the higher the CT value in the PCR, the lower the number of particles, the lower the number of viruses. So basically, a high production of interleukin-1 beta correlated with a low uh, number of virus particles in the blood. So how is this happening? How is it possible for the BCG to induce this long-term change in the myeloid cells, in innate immune cells? And because of time and also because all these data are published, I'm just summarizing now in a couple of slides uh, the work done uh, in, in, in five or six years. So basically what is happening is the following. We have myeloid cells that circulate in our blood and they are not stimulated in the normal situation. When we don't have any infections, they just go around and, and don't do nothing, basically. They don't need gene transcription. They don't need to produce proteins that are important for host defense, such as defensins, cytokines, chemokines, and so on. Because of that, the chromatin is very tightly compacted in the nucleus. It's very tough for, uh, for transcription factors to bind to the promoter, so you don't have gene transcription on these sites. You just have well, the normal gene transcription that is necessary for the homeostasis of the cell, but nothing which is necessary for an active state during an infection. When we get infection, the cell is activated, we get immunological signalings through receptors on the surface of the cell and so on. And what is happening, there are chemical changes being induced which phosphorylate, methylate, acetylate, the histones which are at the core of the nucleosome. At the moment that we change chemically these histones, the chromatin architecture also changes, and the chromatin becomes more loosely packaged. And then the transcription factors can now start to bind to the promoter and initiate gene transcription. And they initiate gene transcription because it's especially the transcription factors activated through immunological signals. There are NF-kappa B, AP1, nf AT, and so on, all kinds of transcription factors which are important for the host defense. They are now binding to the specific regions of the, of the chromatin, they're inducing an immune reaction, they induce production of, of uh, uh, proteins which are necessary for host defense, and we eliminate the, uh, the infection. Now, after we eliminate the infection, we always thought that in these cells, we lose completely these, uh, these chemical changes in the histones, the chromatin collapses back, and the gene transcription is stopping because we don't need it to read and produce things that, that needs energy, that needs, uh, uh, that needs the cell to work for that. So if you don't have an infection, you don't need that. And that is partially true. The gene transcription stops. The chromatin partially goes to the previous conformation. But this is not completely the story. What is happening is also that some of these chemical changes, not all of them, to be able to keep the chromatin open. But some of these uh, changes, they do persist. It's like closing the book, but putting a bookmark at the place that is necessary for the instructions how to fight an infection. So at the moment that you get a new infection, you have to get back to the cooking book, basically. But now you know precisely where to open the book, to open it quicker, to read it more efficiently, and to respond better to the infection. And that is exactly what is happening. The amplitude and the speed of the reaction is much better now, and the cells is, to, uh, is, um, is able to mount a better response. And this is now not specific for a certain pathogen. 
because this is activated by just the general immune activation of the cell. Now, I'm saying that this is completely nonspecific, but completely nonspecific that is not true, because this is dependent on which transcription factors have contributed initially in the first phase of the infection, in the first infection, to opening the chromatin and putting all these uh, uh, histone marks. So we asked ourselves which regions of the chromatin, for example, after BCG or after beta-glucan of candida albicans, which can do the same thing, which regions of the, uh, of, the, of the chromatin, of the DNA, are bookmarked? And which are the genes which are important to be bookmarked during this process? So for that, we did chromatin immunoprecipitation, and we did sequencing of, the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of, uh, of this bookmarked uh, DNA. Um, and then what we have observed is the following. These are regions here that you can observe that are bookmarked basically by beta-glucan or BCG uh, in contrast with these are all type of control conditions. Uh, uh, unstimulated cells on day zero, on day six, and cells which are stimulated with LPS, which does not induce uh, training, but it induces uh, tolerance. And what we have observed when we looked what is specifically opened by, by BCG, for example, is that there are a lot of genes which are important for host defense, integrins, interleukins, uh, G protein signaling, and so on, but also at the same time a lot of genes which are important for cellular metabolism, like glycolysis, oxidative stress, amino acid metabolism, and so on. So we thought, why would the cell completely rewire its metabolism? First of all, we wanted to know, is it really true? Because, of course, this is gene transcription, but does that translate actually with a different metabolite soup in the cell? And we actually perform also a whole metabolome assessment of these cells. And we indeed observed that, that the metabolome of beta-glucan in this case uh, trained cells, but the BCG is the same, is very different. So the metabolite soup in the cells which were trained was very different from RPMI and LPS, so from naive and tolerant cells. So in what, in what way is, is there a difference there? There are a lot of things changing. Well, the cells need more energy, so there is more activation of glycolysis, which produces lots of ATP. And there is another reason why you need uh, to activate glycolysis, because suddenly the Krebs cycles, which usually produces ATP more, uh, more efficiently than glyco uh, glycolysis, is also used not only for catabolic reasons to produce ATP, but also for anabolic uh, uh, processes, such as extracting citrate from the ATP cycle producing acetyl-CoA in the, in the uh, cytoplasm, which is used for cholesterol biosynthesis and lipid formation. Okay, so that is, uh, that is one thing happening. At the same time what is happening, there is also an activation of amino acid metabolism, and the Krebs cycle is replenished through glutaminolysis. Glutamine is transforming glutamate alpha-ketoglutarate, and that enters the Krebs cycle, and interestingly enough, this leads to an accumulation of succinate and fumarate. And then we thought, okay, so we accumulate apparently fumarate and succinate in the cell. Why, why is that uh, happening? And then when looking into the literature, we observed very simple, some, something very important. A lot of metabolites of the Krebs cycles are also cofactors for epigenetic enzymes. And for example, now, because we are interested in succinate and fumarate, other people have shown that they inhibit two important families of histone demethylases. So uh, succinate inhibits Jumanji C demethylases, and fumarate inhibits um, KDM5 demethylases. And then we started to look whether these two enzymes are also changed, basically, in the, uh, in the, in the cells. And what we have observed, indeed, is that while Jumanji C demethylase function was completely normal, so we could not find any change. However, in the trained cells that were more responsive, more, uh, uh, more able to produce uh, uh, cytokines, they had a decreased bioactivity of KDM5 enzymes. So fumarate was able to decrease it, but also training the cells with beta-glucan, but also with BCG was able to, uh, uh, to decrease the function of KDM5 demethylases. If we block this process, so we, if we block the accumulation of fumarate by blocking uh, glutaminolysis with a pharmacological inhibitor, for example, like a BPTS, 
What we have observed is that we lose the capacity of the cells to, be, uh, to amplify their function, and we also lose, actually, the methylation of histones. So what is this accumulation of fumarate doing is inhibiting demethylases. And then because the demethylases are inhibited, the histones remain partially methylated. And that keeps the bookmark present, basically, on the, uh, on the histones. So all in all, what is happening, what is taking place at the level of the cell, there is an interaction between immunological signaling, between metabolic rewiring in the cell, and epigenetic processes which are activated. And again, because of time, this, this is a summary of, uh, of a couple of studies. What we have observed is the following. There is immunological signaling in the cell, and in our hands, it seems that uh, PI3 act mTOR pathway is very important for that. That leads through HIF1 alpha transcription factor to rewiring of the metabolism in the cell with activation of the glycolysis, which is necessary for the, for the energy, but at the same time with reusing in a different way the Krebs cycle. So we accumulate fumarate through glutaminolysis, which inhibits histone demethylases. If we inhibit them, Histones stay methylated, so the bookmarks are there. On the other hand, citrate is extracted from the Krebs cycle, which is used thereafter to produce acetyl-CoA, which is a donor for acetyl group for histone methylases, uh, histone acetylases, and then also produces cholesterol. And one particular metabolite from cholesterol pathway, mevalonate, is secreted out, outside of the cell and it's amplifying, actually, this process through the IGF-1 receptor. So all in all, there is a complete rewiring of the function of the cell so it can provide more response against an infection. Now, this is happening. This, we, we've done these experiments in experimental models in vitro. We, we did mouse studies to show this and so on. And I showed you also that the monocytes, the myeloid cells from BCG-vaccinated individuals, are more potent after two weeks after three months, even after one year after BCG vaccination. After one and a half, two years, it starts to wane. But for at least one year, we have this activation. And we show this activation in monocytes from circulation. But then something is strange here, because the monocytes are in the circulation only for one, two, maybe three days. So how can we observe that we, we see changes in their function after two weeks and three months and one year, these are completely different cells which come from the bone marrow because the bone marrow produces continuously the myeloid cells. So how can we explain that? Well, the only possible explanation would be if similar processes take place also in the progenitors of the myeloid cells in the bone marrow. So then we did a, a new study in which we vaccinated people with BCG and we very nicely kind them not to donate only blood, but donate also some blood marrow before the BCG vaccination and after the BC, BCG vaccination. So we did a bone marrow aspirate uh, just before they got the vaccine and uh, three months later. And then we purified the hematopoietic stem cells from, uh, from these individuals and performed an RNA sequencing to assess their transcriptional program and attack sequencing to assess their chromatin accessibility. And what we have observed, you can see it very clearly here from the heat map, that three months after the BCG vaccination, there were, there were many genes which were changed, basically, in these hematopoietic stem cells. And what was changed is especially the genes which are important for myelopoiesis, granulopoiesis, and the function of the mono, uh, monocytes, myeloid cells. We looked also at chromatin accessibility. We have observed the same thing, and we have also identified a number of factors, among which hepat hepatic nuclear factors, which are important for, for this process. Okay, so apparently the BCG vaccination in our case changes the immune cells, but everything starts basically by reprogramming the myeloid cell progenitors in the bone marrow. Now, we went there after to, uh, to a new question, and we asked ourselves, okay, so apparently we take the monocytes from the circulation, we re-stimulate them in vitro after people got a BCG vaccine, and we see something happening. But is this due to one particular subpopulation in the monocytes, or are all the monocytes in the circulation doing precisely the same? So we want to see 
to assess the heterogeneity of the response at the single cell level. So what we did then, we purified, we purified monocytes from healthy individuals, we incubated them for one day with BCG, we washed the BCG away, we thereafter let them rest for six days, and then we re-stimulated them on, on day six, and then on day seven, we performed single cells RNA sequencing to see whether the entire monocyte population responded in the same way, or do we see changes, different ways in which different monocyte subpopulations respond to this training with BCG. And I, I have to say, we did, in addition to BCG, also beta-glucan and oxidized the LDL and uric acid crystals, because all of them can do this uh, priming, and we have seen the same thing in all of them. And to make a sh long story short, what did we see? We see that there are, at the functional level, in this type of, uh, of model, three types of responses in our monocyte populations. There are monocytes that, we, that are exposed to BCG, but they do not increase their capacity to produce cytokines on day six when they are re-stimulated. We call them non-trainable monocytes, you can see here. Uh, approximately 25% of the monocytes, we could not get them better, let's say. Then we had another population, some 30% of the monocytes, that they did respond it better, but not with everything. They didn't make everything more, and we don't know why. So let me, we just describe, we are at the phase that we are only describing at this moment. But in any case, these monocytes, they responded better, but they produced especially chemokines. They produced much better chemokine, uh, chemokines. They released much better chemokines. You can see it here. But not pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as L1-beta, L6, and TNF. Those were just as much produced as they did before. And then we had another population that, that and we call that MCs from monocytes producing chemokines. And then we had another population which produce more or less everything, approximately 50% of them, or at least the most important cytokines and chemokines that we measured, and especially were very good in producing pro-inflammatory cytokines, especially R1-beta, as you can see here. And from other earlier uh, work from us, but also from other people, we knew that R1-beta is a crucial cytokine for these processes, especially at the level of the bone marrow. But thus, we, we can observe, and we have seen this very... Uh, 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 very solid data, and we validated them in several models, these three types of subpopulation in the way that, uh, that they respond. We have also looked whether, well, maybe these non-trainable cells are what we called the alternative monocytes, or the others are intermediary, and the others are uh, classical monocytes. There are three subpopulations which are usually used to separate the monocytes based on the expression of CD14 and CD16 we could not see that type of separation. So this was a very different functional separation of, of, of the monocytes of population, so not based on the, on the surface expression of CD14 and CD16. Then we took these transcriptional programs that are characteristics of MC and MCI, and we tried to see whether we can identify them in transcriptional, transcriptional data sets from the literature. Does this mean anything? And, and what we have... Uh, found very easily is that they are overrepresented, for example, especially in inflammatory bowel disease. But I'm not going into that now. So that is very interesting because it means that in a, there is an exaggerated MC and MCI program in inflammatory bowel disease. But we looked in two cohorts also of people with COVID-19. And these are uh, published by, uh, by, Dutch, uh, by German colleagues in cell uh, last year, two different cohorts beautiful single cell data uh, uh, from either, either mild or severe, and also control individuals, but mild and severe COVID-19 uh, COVID patients. And we assess the MC and MCI transcriptional programs in, in, in these two cohorts in just the public uh, database. And what we have observed is very clearly that the individuals who had severe COVID-19 were not able to respond properly with a transcriptional program either MC or MCI, with neither of them, in two independent cohorts. So then, well, I'm, I'm doing it like then we thought about doing a BCG trial in COVID, but that's not true because we thought of that previously, but it's nice for the flow. <laughs> um, but then we can think of, of a concept in which if this is true and these P53 
people getting very severe disease lack a trained immunity program in their, uh, in their myeloid cells, would it be useful, for example, to boost that, for example, with a BCG vaccination? And, and the hypothesis would be that, let's say, somebody who, is, uh, who, does, uh, who has an, uh, a low capacity of the innate immune responses to, uh, to fight the virus would allow the virus to multiply, we would have a high viremia in the circulation. That high viremia in the circulation would induce a systemic inflammatory response that would lead to a severe disease and to death, unfortunately. And we see that happening, unfortunately, every day during the pandemic. The idea would be that we boost these innate immune responses in the beginning. That would take care that the virus does not have a free hand to multiply, is, uh, is contained, let's say, the viremia is lower, lower systemic inflammation, low symptoms, and survival. Now, we started this, uh, the first study before the pandemic, actually, because we thought first in general for any type of pathogen, not necessarily only against uh, SARS-CoV-2, and this is the ACTIVATE study of BCG vaccination in the elderly that we have done in, in, uh, in Athens together with Evangelos Jamarelos, our colleague from University of Athens. And elderly individuals who are going home from hospital, they received the BCG, they were randomized to get the BCG vaccination, and then we followed them up for the number of infections. We knew that these are the individuals who are very likely to get infections. They are generally elderly, after a hospitalization, they are partially immunocompromised, they had a high chance of getting an infection. So we asked ourselves, would they get less infections if they would be vaccinated at the moment that they go home? And what we have observed indeed is a 40% decrease in the total number of infections if they had a BCG vaccination. And when we assessed basically what type of, vaccine, uh, what type of infections uh, did they have less, it was especially respiratory tract infections rather than abdominal and urinary tract infections. We think that this is probably to do with, uh, with some anatomical uh, differences between respiratory tract in which we have many more immune cells that are immediately acting uh, um, against the pathogen, for example, alveolar macrophages, whereas at the level, for example, of the, of, of the urinary tract is the epithelial cell which comes first in contact with the uh, with the pathogen, and only after the epithelial cell is, uh, is, uh, is passed, is broken basically by the infection, then uh, the immune, uh, immune uh, system is, is starting to kick in, but at that time we already have the infection and it's diagnosed. So based on this data, then we, uh, we wanted to, to repeat the same, uh, the same uh, study during the pandemic, and this is the ACTIVATE-2 study, uh, unfortunately, you can see uh, these, these are uh, relative, quite small studies, actually. Uh, these were 300 individuals that were randomized to receive placebo and BCG vaccinations, again elderly. These are in Greece, and this is important to mention because in Greece, uh, people had already a vaccination at birth, and this was basically a revaccination. And, and we'll come in a moment back why is that important? And then we assessed uh, the diagnosis of COVID-19 on day 90, 135 and 180, and we see more or less precisely the same as previous in, in the previous study, less, uh, less infections. Now, we wanted also to validate this in a, in a, bigger, uh, in a bigger trial, and in parallel with this uh, study in Greece, we have started also, uh, also several trials, and I, I'll show you one of them for, from which we have data, in the Netherlands. This is a bigger trial in which we, uh, in which we randomized 2,000 elderly individuals to receive, uh, to receive uh, either placebo or BCG vaccination. And the difference with the Greek uh, study are two. One, these are healthy elderly, so they were just volunteering to come, so it's a much healthier population. But also, maybe even more importantly, these were individuals who were not receiving a BCG at birth, so they got the first BCG vaccination when they were 65 or higher, when we got them, uh, when we vaccinated them. And unfortunately, in the, in the Netherlands, we were not able to see the, the positive effects that we have seen. In, in Greece, you can observe here the total number of infections, and this is the uh, COVID number. They were not uh, differing. So apparently, in a population in the Northern European country, which was not vaccinated at birth, 
BCG vaccination was not able to protect against the total number of, BCG, of uh, COVID-19 infection. However, we do not know whether the severity of the, uh, of the infection would be lower, because here we had very few, uh, very few elderly who got in the hospital with a severe disease, only three of them. Two in the placebo and one in BCG. So we, we had 50% reduction. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but of course, we cannot say anything about that. For that, bigger trials are necessary. And fortunately, one of our colleagues from Australia, uh, Nigel Curtis, is doing now uh, a 10,000 um, 10, strong uh, clinical trial in which the endpoint is disease severity and not uh, disease incidence. Despite of the fact that we do not see a difference in the, uh, in the total number of COVID-19 infection, some, something very interesting uh, happened, however, in, in our trial. We collected blood uh, uh, from, uh, from the individuals after the BCG vaccine, at the end of the trial, basically. And we looked also at the titer of anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies in the individuals who had a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 during the trial. They were equal numbers, but something very interestingly happened here, as you can observe, the BCG vaccinated individuals had better serological response if they got a COVID-19 uh, infection. So you can see here for S protein, for uh, N protein, for RBD, three different types of, uh, of antibodies, all of them very clearly either tended to be or were significantly higher in the BCG vaccinated individuals. So although the BCG was not able to protect against the total number of infections here, it seems that people with, uh, uh, with COVID-19, they responded better in terms of serological response if they, they had previously a BCG vaccine. And the same is true also for the cellular responses. These are cellular responses with stimulation. Actually, here is SARS-CoV-2 stimulation. And here is, uh, is uh, influenza, vex, uh, influenza virus uh, stimulation. So, uh, so both cellular and, uh, and serological responses were better, even in the Netherlands. This is just another study to show you that uh, there is now on the bioarchives a very interesting study uh, 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 published by the group of Alan Schur uh, in, uh, at the NIH, in which he gave uh, BCG other subcutaneous or uh, intravenous in the animals. Very interestingly, while he didn't see an effect with subcutaneous uh, BCG, he saw a very strong effect against SARS-CoV-2 with IV BCG. So it might be that the route that we administer is very important in, in terms of BCG protection against uh, COVID-19. But of course, in humans, we cannot give the, uh, the BCG IV. Oh, I'm looking at the time. I still have 10 minutes. Um, during the pandemic, um, in addition to, uh, to BCG, we thought also what other factors can we investigate and identify that might influence uh, the susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. And, and one thing that is happening every year in, in our hospital is influenza vaccination. Unfortunately, not everybody who can get the influenza vaccine does uh, go to, to receive it. So it's approximately 50-50. We have assessed actually epidemiologically how much, how much COVID-19 were in the two groups, either vaccinated or non-vaccinated. In both two first waves of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, there was approximately 40 to 50% less infection in influenza vaccinated individuals. However, of course, this is an observational study that can be biased because the people who go and get the influenza vaccine, maybe they are also the people who respect the rules more or are more careful in general. So the healthy vaccine bias, we cannot get rid of it in this study. So, but that gave us a kind of an indication that maybe something is happening. And actually in the literature, there are several observational studies that also report precisely the same thing. And one study, which is probably the most important coming from, I think, Brazil, is that influenza vaccinated individuals not only have less SARS-CoV-2, but the SARS-CoV-2 severity, uh, the, the COVID-19 infection severity is lower. And here the healthy vaccine bias is not, no longer working because at the moment that the people got, got the infection, they got the infection. So the infection goes on 
unimpeded by your, uh, by your uh, behavior, basically. And the fact that, that they have seen less severity in influenza vaccinated individuals, that is an interesting thing. But anyway, based on this epidemiological data, we, we performed also a, a, an immunological study to see are there other types of uh, vaccines also able to modify the response, the immunological response to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2. And indeed, that was the case when we performed an, an influenza vaccination trial and we stimulated there after the cells we have observed that some, uh, uh, some cytokines, such as our one receptor antagonist, was significantly improved after the influenza vaccination, um, whereas others, such as uh, interleukin-1-beta, was decreased. So it's a shift uh, away from interleukin-1-beta and, uh, and more towards, uh, towards uh, um, uh, modulatory responses, which is a very different program than BCG is inducing. That is also very important uh, to mention. Trained immunity, like, like, we, uh, like we defined it, is a concept that uh, innate immune cells change, but that doesn't mean that all the infections and all the vaccines change these immune responses, innate immune responses, in the same way. So influenza can induce a very different response from a BCG, and BCG can induce a very different response from from measles containing uh, vaccines such as MMR. So you can have and you need to study what are the differences between these programs. Very interestingly also was the fact that we observed that the systemic inflammatory response after influenza vaccination was also very significantly decreased. We performed a, 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 a targeted inflammatory proteomics uh, using a holding platform. And here we measured some 300 different, uh, different inflammatory markers before and six weeks after the influenza vaccination. And you can observe almost everything is lower in the circulation, basically. Influenza induces a very strong immuno, uh, influenza vaccine, induces a very strong uh, immunomodulatory effect, apparently, both at the cellular level, but also at the systemic uh, inflammatory level. And it might be that this could contribute if if it's true that it protects partially, that could contribute to this protection because, of course, very often in the severe patients, we have a dysregulated immune response. And if, if that is uh, changed by, uh, by influenza vaccine, that would be very, uh, very important. And, and the, same, uh, the same type of uh, data were obtained also uh, beginning of this year very nicely by a study in cell uh, by Bali Pulendran, who showed also different regulatory programs induced by a non-adjuvanted and adjuvanted influenza vaccine. Now, everything put together, what, what, uh, what we want to say is the fact that apparently many vaccines can induce changes also in innate immune responses, not only in adaptive immune responses. And that can induce non-specific protection against various types of infections. Now, of course, now in the current pandemic, we are very fortunate because we have now four, maybe many, and four very well working vaccines, another three or four who also work reasonably. So it was relatively easy to make a vaccine against, uh, against SARS-CoV-2. But that doesn't mean necessarily that that would be the truth every time we would get a new pandemic. We might have bad luck the next time that it would be much more difficult. So we would need to learn as much as possible about this non-specific protection because if we can use that in the beginning of a, of a pandemic, even now, for example, if we would have had something that can protect for 30, 40 or 50 percent in the be beginning of a pandemic, you don't need to take all the, uh, all the lockdowns at the same severity, many, uh, many more people will survive and so on. So the idea would be to study these processes and to understand basically what is happening uh, during this non-specific protection in this, uh, by vaccines. So during a pandemic, you test very quickly in the first three or four months a number, three or four or five of these vaccines for their non-specific effects. And if you identify one, you can use that as a breach vaccination to confirm partial protection until the, uh, until the specific vaccines are developed, produced, distributed, and so on. And then you can uh, mitigate the effects of the, of the pandemic. Now, in the last two minutes, um, I want to also to show you that in the last, uh, well, I would like to say uh, 
uh, two years, but actually in the last six or seven years, we have done in parallel another study, also based on the evolutionary processes that have been shown in, in, in plants and, and insects, in which people have shown that if a plant becomes resistant against a, a certain infection, <laughs> it can transmit that protection through seeds in epigenetically mediated mechanisms for up to five generations. So all sorts of plants that grow from that, uh, that plant will become more resistant. And the same has been described for worms and for insects and so on. And this is, um, well, just, uh, just to see in, in vertebrate animals, in many, in many cases has been described that, this, uh, that there is a cross-generational transmission of death protection. And in humans, this has been shown also for metabolic traits. For example, in the Netherlands, people who lived after the Second World War and were suffering from famine, their children, had also more metabolic problems. And that was also epigenetically transmitted. So we asked ourselves whether we can induce some type of protection uh, uh, in, in vertebrates towards infection, and we used the model of Candida albicans infection, a non-lethal Candida albicans infection, in which we infected uh, healthy males with a sublethal infections that they can uh, eliminate very easily in four or five days. And one month later, we mated them with healthy females. And then the progeny from either non-exposed uh, uh, non control mice or the progeny for exposed mice, we then infected with either Candida albicans, but also with E. coli and so on. And to, uh, to make long story short again, what we have observed is that, uh, is that the F1 exposed uh, mice, so the progeny of the fathers who were infected previously, were more resistant to infection. They had lower amounts of, of pathogens in their organs, whereas their immune response was better. This, this is against, uh, against E. coli. This is against uh, Candida albicans, precisely the same. Lower pathogens, higher immune responses. Uh, they respond also better to just uh, uh, non-live microbial stimulation with lipopolysaccharide, for example. They produce more, uh, more TNF or more interferon gamma. And they also, uh, we did this together in collaboration with Thierry Roger in a completely different lab, just to be sure that this can be reproduced by other people with other hands uh, with Listeria monocytogenes infection with injecting zymosin. So just the cell wall of the, of, of, of the fungus was injected in the mice, and we can observe the same cross-generational transmission of, uh, of uh, protection. And this is due to changes, basically, again, in the bone marrow of the, of the progeny. The, the hematopoietic stem cells from the progeny have also a bias towards myelopoiesis and improved function of these myeloid, uh, myeloid cells. And that is mediated through DNA methylation changes in the sperm cells of the mice, of the male mice who recovered from a previous infection. So basically, what, what we can conclude from, from that, then we can have a short-term cross-generational transmission of, of this protection. We have seen this for F1 and F2 generation. In F3 generation, this protection was completely lost. And this is a, a short-term basically Lamarckian process that induces, uh, uh, that induces protection uh, in, in the next generation that could be very important, for example, during a pandemic or a very severe epidemic. And this was very beautifully complemented by the work published by Christina and, and Peter a couple of months ago, in which they show basically that, that if a child has a father with a BCG scar, they have a better chance of survival. So this is very interesting because uh, that means that most likely this is happening also in humans. And this is not a big uh, surprise for me at least because many people have shown this happening for metabolic traits, but we did not evolve such processes to transmit diabetes. We must have evolved this capacity to protect us against something and most likely this would be an infection. I think due to time I will skip the the cancer part, but let me tell you, you can use these processes also in cancer, but what I wanted to show you basically that there is adaptation also within the myeloid cells, in 8 immune cells. Other people have shown this also for NK cells, 
and this is important in a variety of, uh, of diseases. And for those of you who are interested, there is an innate immune memory conference next year in Banff in Canada, a Keystone conference, uh, uh, and everybody is um, more than welcome. And finally, I would like to thank all our collaborators for working with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mihai. As always, you're just uh, leaving me speechless uh, and exhausted, or breathless, I think it is, from all the uh, work that, uh, that, that keeps on coming more and more, and it, the story gets better and better. We have room for a few questions. Will you take the questions? Yeah, up there first. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, 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 a technical point and a, a, a broader question. In your uh, Netherlands uh, study, uh, where you saw uh, antibody, uh, an effect on antibodies, was there any evidence for an effect on T-cell responses? So, so we have not seen it on T-cell responses. We have seen it only on, on monocytes with R1, R6, and so on, and on serological level. Interferon gamma responses were not increased, but I have to say on the technical level, the interferon gamma stimulations with SARS-CoV-2 was very poor, so I'm not so sure whether our, our interferon gamma as, uh, assay uh, was good enough. It's just that they were IgGs, therefore you'd expect that there was a component of T-cell help. Yeah. And then I have a, a, sort of a somewhat more um, a broader question. When I was a graduate student, there was a paper published and then uh, trashed about uh, a paternal uh, uh, um, in inherited uh, um, uh, response to skin grafts. And that was trashed for technical, for perfectly good reasons. Uh, uh, people dismissed it. Uh, it. It was published in Nature. Uh, I forget the name of the author now, but um, is it possible that with hindsight, there may have been a component of what you're describing in their study, despite other aspects that led to the paper being retracted? I I guess so, and I think that now there are several more studies also published very well and in, in various, uh, in various but, but you mean now in humans or in This uh, was in, in, mice. Mice. in mice. This was in mice. Um, so, uh, so in invertebrates, this is accepted now because there is so wildly shown in many, many groups of animals that that is accepted. In vertebrates is much less work done. And I do think that it's very well possible. In, in mice, there was a lot of work, if I'm re not mistaken, done with toxins. I don't know why people have used toxins, but they give all kinds of toxins to the mice and they see things in the next, uh, next generation. So I think that there is more and more acceptability that this is happening. Um, but I don't know that, that paper, but I would love to. It might to, be interesting to, to go back it. and I, look I will, I will at try it again. To, 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 yeah. to look for it, but it's, mm. it's possible, yes. Thanks. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Um, so I would say that all cells have an epigenetic memory uh, from the past. Absolutely, I fully and, agree with you. And uh, I was just wondering whether you think uh, that monocytes have a particular epigenetic memory, whether they have a special ability to remember the past. Um, Yes, this is an excellent question. I fully agree with you. I think that many more t cell types and non-immune cell types as well have an <coughs> epigenetic memory. And, uh, and it was beautifully shown by, uh, for example, in a couple of studies by the uh, group of Elaine Fuchs in, uh, in New York, inflammatory memory in epithelial cells, beautiful, uh, demonstrated how it's work and everything. Um, it, this is a very old, primitive way there is an epigenetic scar, if we can call it like that, of a previous thing that happened to the cell. So I do think it's happening. Regarding the immune cells, I do think that immune cells just started to use these more proficiently, mm -hmm. let's say. Like, like producing cytokines. We think of cytokines being produced by immune cells. But cytokines are produced by epithelial cell, endothelial cells, and right. adipocytes, and many other cell types. But of course, the immune cells are just getting better into it because they use this function actually for host defense. So I do think that immune cells are among the cells which can use this very ancient mm -hmm. primitive type of uh, memory uh, um, at, at a higher level than other cell types. Yeah, 
I'm, I'm just wondering whether you had any insights into the molecular mechanisms that could drive such an increased ability to uh, remember the past of the cell. Um, well, so, yeah, so, so yeah, it, it, could, it could, of course, be um, epigenetic modifiers. It could also be certain types of RNAs that... Well, it is it, happening. It, so yeah. there is beautiful work um, uh, done by Musa Mlanga showing that certain types of lone no-coding RNAs yeah. are crucial for these processes <laughs> because they are also functioning as transporters of epigenetic enzymes within the topologically associated domains within the TEDs. Mm -hmm. So uh, he wrote a beautiful, uh, a beautiful review on, yes. the, uh, on the molecular mechanisms of, of innate immune memory in which he indeed uh, points out precisely what you say. It's at different levels. It's at the, uh, uh, at the uh, metabolic level, but also at the level of histones, level of non-coding RNAs. Also DNA methylation is changing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, <clears throat> sorry, a bit of a cold. Uh, I was wondering if a opposite effect can also take place because a lot of people have been in social isolation for a long time during COVID where they were not exposed to pathogens. Um, and I was wondering after seeing your presentation if that uh, social isolation, isolation and the decrease access to pathogens uh, might speed up the loss of this uh, innate memory in your cells, and if you have any insights on that. Well, I don't have data, but I can speculate that you are right. I think that that is likely to happen. We do see that we lose this, uh, uh, these things upon, upon uh, um, loss of re-exposure, let's say. We do lose these things uh, in, in time, uh, and, and it's just a random process, basically, but we lose this. Uh, so for BCG, we have seen these effects for one year, but but we see it uh, uh, going down uh, thereafter. Uh, and I do think that the, law, uh, that the social isolation now does lead to an increased susceptibility to other infections. We have seen it actually epidemiologically in the children, for example. Uh, last year, we didn't have any RSV or, or influenza in the population. And for the first time in living memory, we had an epidemics of RSV during the summer this year instead of the usual winter. So, so this is happening, so that's why I, I told everybody, just take your flu uh, vaccine this year, because this year the flu would be more interesting maybe than, uh, than COVID-19, unfortunately. But it could also be rainy specific immunity. Yeah, yeah, both, both, both specific and, uh, and innate. I think both immunities are, are going to, uh, to go down because of the isolation. Yeah, it might be interesting to uh, follow like the development of uh, mice in social isolation after Absolutely. vaccination to see how their histone code uh, yeah. degenerates over time in this way. Very but, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the only problem with the mice is that, unfortunately, we have very strict rules of using mice in SPF. Uh, we, are tr we are actually fighting now, fighting in the good sense. We are trying to develop, a, let's say, a natural environment um, uh, mouse uh, facility in which we would have, because what we call now mice in one cage, but they are all SPF. They are kind of isolated already through the environment that, that it's there. Do you have any questions for Yes. We have a DS fellow, Maria Timofiva, with us online. She's asking, uh, or she's telling you, thank you and asking, would it be possible to use retrospective data, such as registry data, to show protection against COVID in those who were BCG vaccinated in the past, similar to what you did in Greek study? Well, it is possible retrospectively, of course, and there were a couple of studies uh, done with that, and they show some associations and uh, very often, but of course, Retrospective data, again, are prone to much more biases than randomized trials because retrospective data then, again, who would get the BCG and why would they get it? Are they people who take it for a certain reason or they want to be healthy or is just because, uh, because their families when they were born were more careful in getting them whereas other families. So yes, it can be done, it can give some clues, but I think that the randomized trials in the end uh, are the most important answer. A 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for a very nice introduction and presentation. Uh, so you also have these uh, endogenous viral genes that are repressed by epigenetics. Uh, so do you see that those could also contribute to this memory effect uh, if they are like de-repressed? I have no idea. You have no I'm idea. I'm very happy if you would study that and tell <laughs> us uh, what's happening. I have no idea. Yeah. I, I haven't thought of that and I haven't studied that, but that would be very interesting, of course, to study. Okay, okay. yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Um, which uh, influenza vaccine did you use? I suppose it was an inactivated influenza vaccine or... It, it was an inactivated, it was not okay. flu mist and so on. Because uh, and also non-adjuvanted, which is very interesting. So uh, our vaccine is in principle inducing more a modulatory slash tolerant phenotype, very different from what BCG is doing. Okay, so, so do you have any sort of hypothesis? A lot of the epidemiological studies done by Christine and, and others ha have shown that there seems to be a difference in uh, that the live vaccines induce trained immunity and uh, the inactivated vaccines uh, might actually induce some tolerance. Do you have any hypothesis on yes, that? Yes, we, we have seen that also, also during our collaborative uh, immunological studies with Christina. We have seen that, of course. Uh, I cannot completely exclude that for some very specific, in, in general, I would say that tolerance is not good. And actually also for, also for COVID, we have, uh, we have uh, indirect, uh, indirect proof of that is not published yet, but what we did, we have very, very large cohorts of individuals in which we stimulated them with uh, various stimuli, and we can separate the people in high producer of cytokines and low producers of cytokines. And, and there are JIVA studies done, uh, done in the literature, so we took the, uh, the genetic polymorphisms which are associated with a severe disease, and we looked in our database to see whether they are high producers or low producers, and we see that the people, so based on this genetic, uh, uh, genetic data, the people who get severe disease, of course you cannot measure that in live disease because then you measure something high, it doesn't mean anything because it's the disease process. But in a healthy the healthy individuals with the risk allele for severe COVID-19, were low producers of cytokines, where those with, uh, with mild disease were uh, intrinsically high producers of cytokines. That being said, I think for every, for every type of infection, we need to study uh, various types of, uh, of, um, of um, uh, vaccines. If BCG, for example, we have, we have another study in experimental models in mice with the colleagues in, in Canada, we see BCG very strongly protected, uh, protecting against influenza, but not against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it's probably this, what we call non-specific is not completely non-specific. There is a, a, a sort of semi-specificity, and for each new infection, you have to just test it in the end. You can have the hypothesis, but you need to test it, I think. I think we have to close down in the interest of time, so any other questions? Uh, come and address to me hi afterwards. Uh, I want to thank all the audience for good questions and once again you, uh, Mihai, and I think we can leave here uh, happy that we are not an island uh, or maybe also a little afraid, but it, uh, what it also goes a long way to tell you what, uh, tell us what you're doing is that we all infect each other and we all program not only each other but also each other's children. It's really a bit scary when you come to think about it, but let's take it in a positive way. We are all connected and uh, thank you, Mihai, thank you to everybody and let's give him a hand. Thank you.